Hello and welcome to another lecture from my class, PSYC 440-640. The class is called Experimental Methods, but it's really more of a class on univariate data analytic techniques from a model comparisons perspective. Um, <clears throat> it's not Monday uh, today, but uh, this picture seemed appropriate. Uh, <laughs> It's obviously from phdcomics.com, and I like the idea that level of motivation for Monday mornings, um, the error bars for that portion of the graph overlap with zero, and that's certainly how I feel on many a Monday morning, and indeed um, on some Wednesday mornings. Well, today's class, or this lecture, is called More About ANCOVA, and that's basically what it is. I'm going to review and practice with ANCOVA. So about the point we left off last time, I was discussing that ANCOVA is this um, interesting example where we take ANOVA and we kind of extend it by allowing that there can be continuous predictor variables, which we call covariates. And we do this because we want to use those covariates in kind of a hierarchical fashion to exert statistical control. Now that's all well and good, but it depends on a couple important assumptions. The first of which is the assumption of the independence of the covariate and treatment effects. And the basic idea here is that the effect of the covariate must be independent of the effect of the treatment, or the group variable or the predictor variable that we're using in our model. So in the example that we've been using from Andy Field's textbook, the effect of partner libido are covariate on um, participant libido must not overlap with the effect of the main predictor variable, drug, our treatment, uh, on the outcome variable, libido. If it does, then reducing the effect of the covariate will also tend to reduce the effect of the treatment, or as I described it last time, we kind of help ourselves about as much as we hurt ourselves. Here's that pictographic representation. And you can see this is a situation uh, that's not good, where we can't make this assumption of independence. And as a result, some, uh, although we are shrinking the sum of squares residual, aka the sum of squares within, or the sum of squares for the augmented model, we're also reducing SS sub m, so sum of squares for the model. That is, the sum of squares they are reduced when we move from the compact to augmented model, or in put in yet another term, the sum of squares error between. We're shrinking the denominator of our uh, test uh, statistic equation, but we're also shrinking the numerator, so that's not really helping us. The important point here, or an important point, is that ANCOVA can be really useful. It's useful for reducing the effect of confounding variables, which we call covariates when we're doing an ANCOVA. It's a way of exerting statistical control, but we can't always use it. We can only use it when the effects of our covariates are independent of the effects of our predictors. And that happens sometimes, but it's not a given. It's something we should explore a little bit. Last time I said that ANCOVA works like a hierarchical multiple regression. Uh, I'll actually get back to that point a little bit later on, but for the time being it brings us to the second assumption for ANCOVA, that is the assumption of homogeneity of regression slopes. Um, what's important here is that when we're doing an ANCOVA, we're entering our covariate into our model at an early step, and we're assuming that the effect of that covariate on the outcome model is the same for all levels of our predictor variable. So if our predictor variable is different groups, like different doses of a drug, we're assuming that the effect that the covariate has on the outcome variable is the same for people in the placebo dose group as it is for the low dose group, and so on and so on. You know, quite literally, what we're imagining is that the lines that we could make representing the relationship between the covariate and the outcome variable, those lines would have the same slope for all the different groups. If they did, those slopes are homogeneous, they are the same, the lines are parallel. Um, if not, the lines are not parallel, and that maybe reminds you back to uh, Unit 2. Um, of interactions, and there is, you know, literally an interaction happening. That's something we don't want to see because in ANCOVA, we're not allowing, or, or rather we are assuming that it is the case that the covariate and the main predictor variable do not interact with each other. So the important point here is ANCOVA only makes sense when 
uh, the covariate is a special kind of variable, one that doesn't interact with the main predictor variable. And that's something we, we're going to explore, or we really should explore, when trying to conduct an ANCOVA. All right, so enough of me talking. Let's actually get to the analyses. Uh, we're using that ANCOVA, uh, I'm sorry, the Viagra covariate data set uh, from SPSS, um, <clears throat> which if you're in my class, you can get from our website. Uh, if not, I'm almost certain you can go to the publisher's website for Andy Field's textbook, Discovering Statistics Using SPSS, and can download uh, the data set there. Um, what I want you to do is run an analysis using a one-way ANOVA. Here what we're going to do is we're going to examine uh, the independence of the covariate and the treatment variable, that is the main predictor variable. And we're going to do that actually by way of an ANOVA. Um, here what we're doing is we're treating our predictor variable as our factor, kind of like before when we did a one-way ANOVA. What's different is instead of treating uh, the outcome variable as our dependent variable, we're treating the covariate as our dependent variable. So go ahead and dial that in click on the options box and maybe ask for a means plot, some descriptive statistics, might as well ask for a homogeneity variance test. That actually might be a default, I'm not sure. Once you've done that, hit OK to run the analysis and you'll get some output. The output will look a little bit like this. Here's the ANOVA table and the, um, the means plot. You can see <coughs> that there is not a significant difference uh, between the groups in terms of their level of the covariate. That's a good thing. Uh, the covariate doesn't differ significantly across levels of our predictor variable or across groups, which means that there's not, or which suggests to us that there is not going to be an overlap between any effect that the covariate has on the outcome variable and an effect that the treatment variable, the, the main predictor variable, has on that outcome variable. By the way, this is also a good example of how if you just quickly look at the means plot, you might assume that there's a big difference between levels of the covariate across our different dose groups. But if you squint a little bit at the y-axis, you see that it's scaling in steps of two tenths of a unit. Um, that's just something SPSS does. I, I think it just automatically sets up the scale of the y-axis in a way that tends to exaggerate differences. Um, I suppose that's not a bad thing, but um, more than once I've been misled thinking, oh gosh, there's a huge difference between group one and group two, or group two and group three, only to see later. Uh, it's probably not that big a difference. And in this case, it's not a difference that's big enough to be statistically significant. Now let's move on and actually run our ANCOVA using the GLM module in SPSS. So go ahead and enter uh, your predictor variable dose of Viagra as a fixed factor, enter libido as the outcome variable, and enter partner libido as the covariate. So that's pretty straightforward. Um, go ahead and click on the button for contrast and ask for simple contrast using the first uh, group as the uh, reference category. That is using, in this case, the first group that appears in the ordering of values in our um, predictor variable is the placebo group. So that makes a good natural uh, reference group. So again, select contrast simple. And if the button isn't already set to first as the reference category, click on it. And then if necessary, hit change so that it records dose simple first as the contrast that you want. Before hitting OK and running the analyses, go ahead and ask for some options. Uh, in the options area, you can um, ask for display means for dose and compare main effects using an adjustment, the SIDAC adjustment. That's essentially asking for a post hoc test. Uh, you can also ask for descriptive statistics and parameter estimates and ask for that Levine's homogeneity of variance test, kind of like we've done before. Wait a minute, you might be wondering, should we center our covariate? It's a predictor variable, and back when we were doing multiple regression, we talked a lot about centering predictor variables. In this case, it might make sense to center our covariate, uh, because probably, hopefully, nobody has a partner who has zero libido, um, although I guess it's possible. Um, but probably we don't have to in this case, because we're uh, not allowing 
the covariate and the predictor variable to interact. So we don't need to worry so much about collinearity with respect to the interaction term. And we already know that the predictor variable and the covariate aren't particularly correlated with one another. So to be clear, we could center the covariate, but we might not in this case need to. And in fact, I think in this example, I just didn't bother to. So once you've hit OK, you'll get a whole load of output. And my goal in this uh, lecture really is just to walk through different parts of the output, um, partly to illustrate the different features of ANCOVA, but also just to provide a bit of a review for um, using the general linear model module for relatively simple analyses. And this ANCOVA is fairly simple. So part of the output you'll get is a Levine's test of variance. And this is something which is useful for evaluating the assumption of homogeneity of variance, which applies to ANOVAs and ANCOVAs as well. Indeed, it applies to all general linear models. Um, you'll notice here that the Levine's test is significant, which is in a way not a good thing. It suggests to us that there are significant differences between the variances of our different groups. If we look over our descriptive statistics, which will be somewhere further down the uh, the list in the output, you can see that the standard deviation, which is just the positive square root of the variance, is quite different for the high dose group as compared to, say, the low dose group. Um, we should also notice here, and you can see that from the cell size, you know, the n for each of our groups, that they're different uh, sized groups. So we've got a violation of an assumption of ANOVA, and we've got uh, small group sizes, and we've got unequal group sizes. So if this was a real example, at this point, I think, gosh, you know, I'm not even sure it makes sense to do an ANOVA or ANCOVA because we've got some pretty severe violations of assumptions. Perhaps we should gather some more data. Perhaps we should do a non-parametric test and so on. But it's a silly example, so we'll just kind of move on. Just note here that the there is this difference. Now, I've mentioned, I think, in a previous lecture a while ago, there's another calculation that we can do that kind of gets at the same idea of unequal variances across groups, and that's called Hartley's FMAX, which is just a really simple um, ratio of the group which has the most variance to the group which has the least variance. And once you get that value, you go to the um, go to the internet, and like so many things in life, you go onto the internet and look up a table for Hartley's FMAX. And so you can see here with our sample size and with the number of groups we have, or the number of variances, number of groups we have, three in this case, the critical value for Hartley's FMAX is I don't know, probably a little bit less than two or three. It's, you know, this is not the best picture. Um, suffice it to say that our value for Hartley's FMAX is probably a little bit below the critical value. Um, that's good. That suggests to us that using Hartley's FMAX as a way of testing unequal variances, we might not have evidence for a significant difference. Um, to be clear, if this was real data, I would already be pretty worried based on the results of the Levine test. I'm just highlighting here that there is such a test as Hartley's FMAX, and um, it can be interpreted in the way that I've described, and it provides us with a similar source of information that is a way of testing whether the variances in two groups are equal or are unequal. Moving down in our output, we can see here the test of the between subjects effects. And uh, you can see here that the overall um, test for the omnibus is significant. So uh, our predictor variable, that is group membership, is significantly associated with our outcome variable, that is libido. And this is after we've controlled for our covariate. By the way, here is the, uh, the analysis that I've run. Uh, I basically just re-ran the analysis, except I didn't include the covariate. And I did that to illustrate the fact that um, without the covariate, the, what GLM calls error, or which is elsewhere called the sum of squares for the augmented model, or the sum of squares within, if you're in the world of ANOVA, or the sum of squares residual, if you're in the world of regression, that value is smaller uh, without the covariate. I'm sorry, is, is larger without the covariate. There's more unexplained uh, variance, 94.123 as compared to 79.047. Uh, so it's larger when we don't include the covariate, including the covariate shrunk that term. 
Um, but notice here that the sum of squares error for the compact model, which is called in GLM the corrected total, or in the uh, world of ANOVA is just called total, um, or actually I think everywhere is called total, so that one's easy, that stays the same. So total amount of variability we're trying to explain in the outcome variable hasn't changed, just the amount that is left unexplained um, has changed. Moving on, we get our parameter estimates. And you can see here that uh, we've, we've got our various unstandardized regression coefficients uh, for our covariate partner libido. Well, we've got our intercept, um, we've got partner libido, and we've got our two uh, doses. Uh, that is the two uh, dummy coded variables that SPSS set up for us in order to run this analysis in GLM. Now you may be wondering, looking at this equation, here I've just substituted in those unstandardized regression coefficients, is it kind of weird that two of these are negative, or what, does the, what do these negative numbers, negative 2.23 and negative 0.44 mean? Well, they're just a consequence of the way SPSS sets up the coding. It just happens to be the case that SPSS, when it does its version of dummy coding, puts these 0, 0 values in the highest level of the predictor variable. And the highest level here happens to be the high dose group. And so each of those dummy codes, or what each of what SPSS calls dose equals one, dose equals two, are contrast with that high dose group. So you can here see here, um, there's a significant difference between the placebo dose group and the high dose group, that's dose one, and a significant difference uh, oh, I'm sorry, a not significant difference between the low dose group and the high dose group. That's dose equals two. Dose equals three is just a redundant term. So obviously there, there are no values uh, for that one. Uh, also, and I, I guess I didn't mention this, but it's obvious, I, I hope from my slide, that um, participant libido is significantly related to partner libido. So, I mean, that's good, I suppose. If not, then it wouldn't have been a good choice for a covariate because it wouldn't have been related to the outcome variable. Um, by the way, of course, um, note that these uh, contrasts here are dummy, they're essentially the same sort of contrast we get through dummy coding. If we wanted to use kind of the language and, <clears throat> and nomenclature of the GLM module, we call them simple contrasts with a reference to the last group. The last group being the group that's the highest in the order. In this case, that corresponds to the high dose group. Now, it's interesting to note here we have asked for significant, uh, we've asked for simple contrasts with reference to the first group. Remember, that's something we asked for using the little, um, <coughs> pardon me, using the little contrasts menu area of GLM. And you can see here that those contrasts are both significant. So, um, Level two compared to level one, that's the low dose group compared to the placebo dose group, statistically significant, as you can see. And level, uh, I'm sorry, um, level three compared to level one, that's the high dose group compared to the uh, low dose group. I'm sorry, the high dose group compared to the placebo dose group, that is also statistically significant. And by the way, that's actually the same uh, number, same value for that contrast as was the dose equals one. Um, you know, uh, information in the parameter estimates on the previous slide. Moving on down the output, we get a table for the estimated means for our different groups. These are estimated in the sense that they are the predicted values that we would have for the means if everyone had a partner libido of 2.73, which is the mean for the covariate. So this is a bit like going back to unit two with multiple regression, and we're asking what's the predicted value um, that the model gives us if we equate everyone on our particular covariate, our, our particular um, controlled variable, in this case, our, our covariate. Um, just by way of a comparison, these are the uh, uncorrected um, or unadjusted values for the means. So if you just created the means or computed the means for the different groups, you'd see the values in the second table, um, but above you see the values estimated, in a sense, controlling for the covariate. Moving further down, we see pairwise comparisons. You know, of course, if you asked for them and you can see uh, these are just post hoc tests, um, 
we can see the difference between the placebo and the high dose group is statistically significant. The difference between the placebo and the low dose group isn't statistically significant. So important point here, coefficients, contrasts, post hoc tests, we're getting a lot of the same information or at least similar information. Lots of comparisons between different levels of the predictors. Um, it's worth understanding all of these different techniques so that you can get the comparisons you want. Now in this case I just sort of threw everything in and said well you know let's do some contrast. Let's also look at some parameter estimates which are also going to give us contrast. Let's go ahead and um, look at uh, some uh, post hoc tests which are going to give us comparisons, pairwise comparisons just like our contrasts. But the only thing I didn't ask for is a polynomial trend. Um, if you were doing this for real, you probably wouldn't ask for everything like that. You would probably pick one or two uh, sources of information, but here I'm trying to do a bit of a review. So hopefully that's fairly clear and hopefully it is useful for you to review some of these ideas. Now at this point you might be asking, wait, what about that assumption of homogeneity of regression slopes? I kind of made a big deal about it before, but I haven't done anything yet to evaluate it. And we should evaluate assumptions when we're going to do an analysis, really of any sort. Well, we can evaluate this uh, assumption, but we have to run an analysis again in the GLM module, and we have to do it slightly differently. So go back to the GLM module. Uh, basically, the input parameters are all the same. The thing that we're going to do differently is I want you to click on that button for model, and we're going to do a custom model uh, instead of the default, which is a so-called full factorial model. By the way, we'll be talking about this a lot more in the next unit. What you need to do is click the button for custom under specify model, then click over uh, dose and partner libido into the fee area called model, then highlight both of them and select build terms type interaction and click on that. What you should see ultimately is, as you can see on my screen here, dose times partner libido, an interaction term, just like we would have made in uh, back in the regression unit that reflects this interaction between dose, and, uh, our predictor variable, and our covariate. Now remember, this shouldn't happen in ANCOVA. ANCOVA doesn't allow or assumes that there is no interaction between the predictor variable and the covariate. We're going to force it to happen using a custom model to see if that interaction is statistically significant. And here's some of the output we get, and oh dear, it looks like there is a significant interaction between uh, our main predictor variable, dose, and our, um, our uh, covariate partner libido. Uh, so this isn't really good, um, at least not with respect to the assumption of homogeneity of regression slopes. But since we found an interaction, you might be wondering, well, what's the interaction look like? And if you go all the way back to unit two, you'll remember there are a number of different techniques for exploring uh, the nature of interactions. In the case of uh, ANCOVA, it's actually really simple. Our predictor variable is already categorical, so we don't need to make groups on it. We can just go ahead and open up the chart builder in SPSS and create a group scatter plot where we have participant libido, our covariate on the x-axis, I'm sorry, partner libido, our covariate on the x-axis, participant libido, our outcome variable on the y-axis, and then we're just going to use uh, our predictor variable which is naturally categorical as our grouping variable or the set color variable. So I've kind of dragged it all together like that. Go ahead and hit OK. And then once you've got your uh, output, double click on it to open up the chart editor and add trend lines for each of our groups. And, and once you do, you'll get something that looks basically like this. Um, now you can see there's not a homogeneity of regression slopes, or at least not complete homogeneity. It sort of looks like the placebo dose group and the low dose group, there is homogeneity of regression slopes for those two groups. They're about the same. But the high dose group is totally different. Um, that's a problem. We probably shouldn't have run ANCOVA at all in this situation because the effect of partner libido on participant libido, the effect of the covariate on the outcome variable changes a lot or is very different at different levels of our predictor variable and it shouldn't be. There shouldn't be an interaction and yet there is. So this is fake data that Andy Field uh, made up I'm sure and that I've used over the years for my class. 
Um, obviously, we're doing it for illustration purposes here. But um, what you would want to do if you were doing a real analysis is evaluate this assumption first off. And then if you saw something like this, like a significant interaction between the covariate and the predictor variable, uh, you wouldn't run an ANCOVA, or at least you wouldn't run it and call it an ANCOVA. There may be uh, ways to develop a model that has both continuous and predictor and um, categorical predictor variables, but it can't be technically an ANCOVA since an ANCOVA technically doesn't allow these uh, interactions to occur. You'd have to make a model which does allow the interactions to occur. So just as we finish up this lecture, let's consider one or two more questions. Uh, a question you may have is, uh, can you run ANCOVA as a regression? That is, can you run this type of analysis through the regression module of SPSS um, rather than through the GLM module? And the answer, of course, is yes, because ANCOVA is a hierarchical multiple regression. It's not very hard to run it as such in the regression module. And as you'll see in the following slides, there are some reasons why you might prefer to do this rather than use the GLM module. And for this purpose, I've created uh, a data set, which is the Viagra covariate dummy data set. All I've done is dummy coded our categorical predictor variable using the approach that we've used repeatedly across the semester. And what I want to do is run a multiple regression in my first step entering my covariate, that's continuous predictor variable, to remove its effect on the outcome variable. And then my second step, I'm gonna enter those dummy codes for my categorical predictor variable uh, dose, of, dose of drug. So here I am in the regression module, uh, analyze regression linear um, in block one or step one, what SPSS calls block one, I'm entering partner libido, I'm gonna click the next button and in the second block, I'm gonna enter my two dummy codes that represent my categorical predictor variable of dose. I'm also gonna ask for some, uh, some different statistics like, um, uh, estimates of my regression coefficients, um, parameter estimates, aka ask for confidence intervals, model fit, and R squared change. There are other things there we could ask for, but I think in this example I, I didn't really bother. Hit OK, get some output. Output looks like this. Here's our nice model summary, and you can see that uh, when we focus on model two, uh, technically the second step or augmented model version two, if you want to call it that, the addition of the predictor variable um, or the dummy codes for the predictor variable improves the fit of the model significantly. So um, once controlling for uh, the covariate, there's still a significant effect or significant improvement in fit when we add our main predictor variables into the model. Moving down in the output, we get to our, our, our ANOVA table. And you can see that the model that includes dose of the drug, that is our two dummy code variables, that model is statistically significant. It's also interesting to note that the sum of squares error for the augmented model goes down when the covariate and dose are included. So there's less unexplained variance in the outcome variable. So um, that's good. You know, we, we ideally we'd like to be able to see that residual, which is sum of squares error for the augmented model, or in the world of ANOVA, it's called sum of squares error within. Uh, we'd like to see that number as small as possible. It goes from 104 and change to 79 and change. It would be nice if we could have it be as small as possible. So relative to uh, the amount that's explained, it you know, it's it's as small as, as possible. Um, anyway, just by way of comparison, here's a table from the GLM module. Uh, and you can see, although the names are different, the numbers are the same. So what uh, regression module calls regression is called corrected model in the world of GLM. Um, what regression module calls residual is called error in the world of GLM. And what regression module calls total is um, called corrected total in the world of GLM. So same numbers, different naming conventions, and of course that can be confusing, I, I, I certainly understand. Uh, but once you practice it a few times, hopefully it becomes much more familiar. Moving on down, we can see our coefficients for our regression output. Um, they're pretty easy to interpret, especially if we remember the naming, I'm sorry, the, uh, well, I guess the naming conventions or the value conventions of our dummy coding. I set up dummy coding this way, where I gave zero, zero values to the 
folks in the placebo dose, the lowest level of my predictor variable. That means that each of my dummy code variables is a test of a contrast between some other level, low dose or high dose, and that first level, placebo. And again, you can choose this the way you want. SPSS automatically assigns 0, 0 to the highest value or the highest level of our predictor variable. Here it makes much more sense to assign it to the lowest level, which again is one of the nice reasons I like to use the regression module. It gives me more flexibility to choose the coding conventions that I want. If we take a look at these regression coefficients, uh, because we're using dummy coding, they're giving us non-orthogonal contrasts or comparisons between groups. And we can see that the contrast between um, placebo dose and low dose, that's what dummy code variable one gives me, is statistically significant, as is the contrast between placebo dose group and high dose group. That's what dummy code two gives me. By the way, if I was to try and get the same contrast in the GLM module, I could ask for them. I could ask for simple contrast with the first group as the reference. And although the output looks a little bit different, fundamentally the numbers are the same. So the unstandardized regression coefficient for that contrast between uh, low dose and placebo dose is 1.786. And you can see that as the contrast estimate in the GLM output, it's the same value as the unstandardized coefficient in the regression output. And the t-tests are the same, the probability values are the same, and so on. You even get the same confidence intervals. So same test, same comparison, just presented, asked for in different ways and presented in different ways. And you may choose to use GLM module. I tend to do a lot of stuff with the regression module. I just feel a bit more comfortable there. But it's comforting and interesting, I think, to notice that you can get the same results from doing the, the analyses in slightly different ways, or at least with slightly different uh, modules. So same result. So if we just take a little bit of a closer look at those regression coefficients, those um, unstandardized values for dummy code variable one and dummy code variable two, we'll notice that those reflect differences between the adjusted means. If we go back and look at that table of adjusted means for our previous analysis, or we get it from GLM, we can just do the math and see that the difference between placebo and low dose group adjusted is 1.78. Um, if you want to compare that, you can look at the original um, means and see the difference there. The point is that those regression coefficients reflect differences between adjusted means of groups, adjusted for the influence of the covariate. Okay, so you might be wondering after all this, why would you want to do your ANCOVA as a, uh, as a regression? Um, I like doing it because I think ANCOVA as a, uh, as a multiple regression, that is ANCOVA done in the regression module of SPSS is often easier to um, customize, let's say, than ANCOVA done in the GLM module, which I sometimes find a little bit fussy, especially if I have to use syntax. So let me give you an example of this, and I'm going to use um, a same data set, except now instead of using dummy code variables, I'm using contrast coded variables, contrasted for Helmert contrasts, much as we've uh, used throughout this unit. My hypothesis, I might want to test the hypothesis like people who take uh, any dose of the drug will have a higher libido than those who take no dose of the drug. That would be like a test of the expectancy effect. I might have another hypothesis that um, people who take a high dose of the drug will have a greater effect than people who have low dose of the drug. That would be like a test of the pharmacological effect of the drug. That's the same as we did before. The only thing different now is I want to account for that covariate or I want to statistically control for partner libido. So I'm running my analyses in the regression module again. Um, this is a little bit confusing, I realize, uh, because I called them in my data set dummy coded variables or you know dummy variable one, dummy variable two. Technically they're contrast coded variables, so don't get too confused by that. Um, they're the same contrast coding scheme, negative two, one, one, zero, negative one, positive one that we've used before. I just for some reason made a mistake and called them dummy instead of contrast, which I typically do to keep things straight. Enter those um, or enter the covariate in the first step, enter those contrast coded uh, variables in the second step. We get the output, it looks a little bit like this. 
the addition of dose of drug improves the fit of the model. It's worth noticing that this is the same, uh, the model summary is exactly the same as when we use the dummy coding approach. This time I've used contrast coding, previously I used dummy coding. It's the same variance, it's just described in different ways. We're kind of breaking up the groups in different ways, but it's fundamentally the same groups. Here's my ANOVA table suggesting that the overall model is significant. Here's the GLM output. It's the same. Naming conventions are a little bit different. Here are those regression coefficients, which are giving me orthogonal contrasts between groups or in groups of groups. So is the placebo dose group significantly different from the average of the low and high dose group after controlling for the effect of partner libido? Yes, it is. Is the low dose group significantly different from the high dose group after um, after controlling for the effects of partner libido, um, it is not. Um, if we take a look at those uh, adjusted means, we can see them over there, and we can see that those differences, those unstandardized regression coefficients, just reflect kind of like the weighted uh, differences between those groups. So just as we saw before, um, unstandardized regression coefficient B sub 1 is the average of the low and high dose group minus the average, uh, the average for the placebo group. Um, it's one third of that value because there are three groups in the contrast. And uh, unstandardized regression coefficient B sub 2, that's just the high dose group minus the low dose group. It's half of that difference because there are two groups in that, uh, in that comparison. And if you're at all curious about those fractional um, weights, uh, you might want to check out my supplemental video on coding and contrast where I talk about using fractional contrast codes to get rid of those. Um, it's not a problem that they're here. We would just need to you know, remember that if we wanted to describe to someone the difference between the average of, let's say, the low and high dose group as compared to the placebo dose group, we'd have to multiply that number 0.668 by, by 3 to give the value in the metric of the outcome variable. What about using syntax? Well, I find the presence of covariates makes syntax a little bit tricky in GLM module. That's why I like the regression approach. So I'm not going to talk too much about syntax in GLM for ANCOVA. Again, my preference is to just run things through, um, I'm sorry, is to run things through a uh, uh, regression module, but, but there is syntax out there. Maybe I'll talk about it in a supplemental video. To wrap up, let's talk a little bit about effect sizes. Um, SPSS gives us those t-tests uh, for the different contrasts, whether they're contrasts we get from contrast coding or contrasts from dummy coding. It's pretty easy to convert those uh, to regression uh, to correlation coefficients, which are fairly easy to interpret as effect sizes. GLM, the GLM module in SPSS gives us another type of effect size that's called partial eta squared. I'll talk a lot about partial eta squared in the, uh, in the next unit, that's unit four, where I talk about factorial ANOVA, but for the time being, just observe or consider that it's a type of effect size that's useful for comparing different effects in an analysis. So if you had more than one predictor variable in your categorical um, I'm sorry, in your factorial ANOVA, uh, you could compare different effect sizes using partial eta squared. So in the GLM module, if you want that estimate of effect size, you just have to ask for it. It's in the options area. You can see I've clicked on estimates of effect size. And I get some output that looks a little bit like this with partial eta squared added as the last column uh, in my table for between subjects effects. Now, as with all measures, or most measures of effect size, um, maybe not so much correlation coefficients, but with most measures of effect size, there's some disagreement over exactly how to characterize the size of an effect. So I usually just end up looking up in the textbook or Googling uh, guidelines for um, estimates of effect size. But the ones that we see here for dose and for partner libido would probably fall in the medium to large range. Um, that's just you know by, by convention. If we're interested in those uh, si those effect sizes for the actual contrast themselves, we can get values uh, for the t-statistics 
um, and degrees of freedom and we can subject those to the, our little equation there and compute correlation coefficients for the contrast between placebo and low dose group and between placebo and high dose group just plugging in the numbers if you will and uh, those as you can see are much easier to interpret because if I said you know correlation of 0.38 you know that's a pretty moderate or maybe even a little bit large size correlation in the realm of uh, psychology even more so if I said correlation 0.47. Obviously correlations can only go as high as 1.0 and as low as negative 1.0. So they're a little bit easier to interpret, I think, than partial eta squared. And what's important here is they're giving us effect sizes for specific contrasts, not for an, the overall effect of the model or an, a, a component of the model, like you know dose or the covariate. Um, these specific comparisons are, are often things that we're con a little bit more interested in or might be more concerned about. Anyway, if I wanted to write up all these results, I might do the following. I might write, well, you know, the effect of the covariate um, partner libido was significantly related to participant libido. So I might report the uh, test for that effect. Um, I say after controlling for the effect of partner libido, the re relationship between dose and participant libido was also statistically significant. And planned contrast revealed the high dose of Viagra significantly increased libido compared to placebo, but not compared to a low dose of Viagra. So pretty straightforward. The only thing I would say now looking at this is it'd probably be better to report um, exact values for the uh, sig uh, for the significance levels for those p-values. You know, maybe report out to a few decimal places rather than using the older convention of is it less than 0.05, is it less than 0.01. Uh, but otherwise, that's a pretty standard write-up for these results. Well, hopefully that's made sense. Um, I know I'm cutting things a little bit short. I guess it's been about 40 minutes, so maybe not that short. Um, I hope you've liked this lecture. It's meant to be just a bit more about ANCOVA and a bit of a review more generally for doing ANOVA and ANCOVA in a couple different ways, either in the regression module, in the ANOVA module, or in the GLM module. Um, hopefully it's been interesting. If you have questions, hit me up in the comments section. Otherwise, if you're enrolled in my class, make sure you're studying. The test is on Thursday, which at the time of recording happens to be tomorrow. Uh, so good luck for my students and just, well, good luck for everyone else. Good luck in your tests and trials that your life gives you. All right, bye-bye.